Good evening, viewers, and thank you for joining in on time. This evening, we have with us the very first episode of Design Con Fab, presented by Jaqua Bath and Light in collaboration with IDAC. The first half of today's episode will witness the most revered project, the Golden Temple. It was brought to you by architect Jaqua Tikar of Design Associates, Inc., along with Mrs. Saradhi Basur of Lucent Worldwide. The session convener is Mr. Mohit Ajela, President, Jaguar Group. The second half of the session is a panel discussion on judging the book by its cover. So stay tuned to learn more about the architecture and lighting marvel, our very own iconic project, and to find out whether you will continue to judge the book by its cover. Good evening, viewers. Indeed, a pleasure to welcome you back to the second edition of Jaguar EconFab. I am Mohit Hajela, your convener for the special event today and representing Jaguar Group. Facade lighting has intrigued all of us. To some, it's sheer opulence. To some, it is thoughtful indulgence. However, for any onlooker, it is sheer magnificence and grandeur of a beautifully lit built structure or remnant of the same. In one of the earlier forums, I had said, silent structures speak volumes. And who amongst you will disagree that when it comes to facade lighting of the Golden Temple, the entire connotation holds so much relevance. Celebrating an iconic structure, the monument has some unique construction influences that combine Muslim, Hindu, and European design principles. Each element of elegance that marks that this distinctive monument has its own saga of history as well. The interior and exterior works, the entrances, the darshan deori, the holy pool that surrounds the Gurudwara, all unfold a unique style, a style in imaginative, rebellious, and worthy minds and genes of the Sikh gurus who created it. Today, Golden Temple stands unparalleled as an epitome of faith, sacrifice, and divinity. Most importantly, it stands as an inspiration and motivation to the budding architects. To discuss further on the facade lighting of the Golden Temple, I have two very eminent designers, consultant designers today, Mr. Savdi Basur from Lucent Worldwide and architect Jay Kartikar from Design Associates. Briefly, welcome first. I'm in such an illustrious panel today. Okay. And uh, to briefly share their profile, uh, Mr. Savdi Basur is the principal of Lucent Worldwide, one of the leading lighting design practices in Asia and with offices in India, China, Qatar, and Germany. Sardeep has over three decades of lighting experience, has completed more than 5,000 large and small creative projects, some of which are the Sydney Opera House, the Kuming Convention Center, in fact, one of the largest convention centers in the world, the Edition Hotel, Sanya, the International Financial Center at Changchun, the Shenzhen City Landscape Lighting Project, the Golden Temple Namritsa, the Bradeshwara Temple and the Pink City Illumination Project, Jaipur. For the Shenzhen City Illumination and Beautification, Sardeep was awarded and invited to speak at the European Parliament on how the new lightscape reduced light pollution and yet beautified the city. What a, what a profile, what a tall accreditation. Sardeep, it's such an honor to have you on the forum. It's my Absolute honor, it's my pleasure. pleasure. Thank such you. a pleasure. Yeah, Thank you so much. And now coming to Jay Karthikar. Jay, yes, equally needs no introduction. Representing Design Associates Incorporation. Design Incorporation actually believes that raw built mass transmutes to architecture only when it is underpinned by reason and animated by ideals. Concepts like sustainability, accessibility, and economy are intrinsic to their rigorous design process. And while they dovetail their strategy with the client's vision, 
what they value and nurture the most is their creative spark, which introduces the element of delight into design. In the process, yes, they have over the years done diverse and extensive portfolio of projects ranging from healthcare, key common buildings, monuments, education, urban design, landscape, commercial and offices, paramilitary, heritage, tourism, housing and residential, to interior and product design. And some of the most noteworthy projects for J and Design Associates, they have done the Bharat Ratan Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar Memorial at Mumbai and Amravati, Ames Rajkot, Gorakhpur, Raipur, Batinda and New Delhi extension. They have done the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Memorial the Golden Temple Complex and urban improvements in Amritsar, something that's, that we are, we are, I mean, one of the famous projects that we are talking today. The Institute for Security and Law Enforcement in Maldives, the new Supreme Court at Mauritius, and the, Nas and the National War Memorial, Delhi. I think without much ado, I'd like to over to you, Mr. Sardi Basur and Jay, to present the project credentials. And, uh, and to, to our audience, believe me, this is one of the iconic projects that we are talking about, the facade lighting of Golden Temple and the redevelopment project. If I, I would say, I mean, uh, the way that the, the entire space has been revitalized, it is something for which adorns the nation and happens to be one of the Benjay. Yeah, you go first. Yeah, I will. Um, so, you know, um, I'll just give you a broader uh, picture of, of how this whole thing began. Um, so this was, you know, um, I often say that uh, a client is really critical for this for, for a job. And, you know, a client with the right uh, uh, intent, um, you know, and a broad minded approach uh, where they're happy to listen to ideas. So uh, this job started with an international competition. Uh, for, uh, you know, redesign of the entrance plaza of the Golden Temple. And, um, you know, a, a fantastic competition uh, organized in a really professional way, a three-stage competition where we, you know, just started with initial sketches and progressively, you know, with inputs from the jury, went on refining uh, these designs to a point where they kind of, you know, became uh, synchronous with the ideas of the client. Uh, so that was the starting point. Now, you know, um, after that, um, I could just quickly go through a presentation, which you know is more easy to explain uh, how we went about the process. Uh, but um, so there, I, there goes. I'll just start off that presentation. Mm, give me a moment. Okay. So you know, it started with uh, with the space bang in front of the Golden Temple, and progressively, uh, you know, for us, Mr. Basur, of course, looked at the complete uh, the, the temple complex. But for us, it started at the entrance plaza to the temple. And then it, you know, stretched into the streetscape, which leads to the temple. So, uh, you know, this is what it looked like earlier. It was a typical, you know, space in front of every temple, a mishmash of parking, green space, a little bit of this, that, and the other. And, you know, one of the things here was, of course, uh, post uh, Operation Blue Star, the whole edge of the temple was, you know, a kind of a rough edge. Uh, you know, as, as an urban point of view, there was, you know, all sorts of serrations and breaks, which, of course, you know, had been, you can see, as you can see, whitewashed over and, you know, a bit of green put in, but it was visible that there was, you know, some break from the city. And that's something which was, you know, uh, visibly troublesome. Uh, so then, you know, uh, if you look at the diagram above, um, simplistic diagram, which talks about a very fragmented space. And I think our thought process was somewhat straight, uh, simple, and quite often the simpler ideas were. So, you know, the thought was to create a large public space in front of the Golden Temple, a clean, formal space. And all these serrated edges, you know, we thought we could try and smoothen out and create a facade uh, along the edge, which basically ties it back to the city. Uh, at the same time, you know, there were a number of functions like shops, uh, drinking water, hand washing, you know, all these typical things you have in any temple which were just spread all over the place. So once we created this edge, we got these, uh, if you look at the lower image, a number of these red spaces and these orange spaces, which we marked up here, which became free spaces where we could, you know, reorganize these functions. So one of the results of uh, the process 
is that practically all the shops which were lining up the base of the golden temple have disappeared and you know you get a clean urban space with a large uh, underground space which has a museum parking uh, you know spaces for vip visitors uh, uh, you know uh, well i think we've got um, a large number of other public facilities down there plus all the you know all the amenities and uh, things like the substations even got you know multiple double decker drains and stuff like that going under the plaza you don't see what's happening in there but you know it was an interesting exercise in just rerouting this into something interesting so this is what we thought we'll do uh, and you know of course apart from the very large trees which we didn't manage to grow on the basement top uh, pretty much uh, this is what you see today um, so a, a clean design with uh, you know spaces which lead downwards into a museum space um, a large space underneath which uh, you know um, uh, amardeep behel has done a fantastic job uh, with uh, an audio visual based museum uh, you know which carries you through the journey of a day in the golden temple a little bit about the gurbani and about the gurus so that's been a very interesting space he's created underneath uh, and that's something you know for the visitor who doesn't come as a regular visitor or a seek who doesn't know about the religion uh, this 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 caters to the the international visitor and the other domestic visitors too makes the place fruitful and interesting and you looked at you know using a palette of materials which picks up from the golden temple of course we're using marble makrana and there's a combination of you know pink and white makrana little less known that you know makrana also has this pink tone but we thought we'll try and use these and you know the flooring picks up from patterns of fulkari you know from from the heritage of punjab in so many ways and from the building right next door you know uh, the, the the marvel that it is um, so you know the spaces within also have this you know same look and feel of a, a silent white space um, typically that's really the interesting part of the golden temple too that uh, the exterior is all this white and you know the interior is this is is this golden form which really strikes you differently so we didn't want to really make something overpowering here it was low key kind of blending in with the city letting the golden temple stand out as it should uh you know some more modernish elements but again you know kept very low key these are you know staircases in and out of the basement uh which you know uh, just simple spaces with escalators also of course we've catered for the disabled everywhere um apart from this you know this interesting line the the blue red and the pink lines are these urban edges which we redid so i'll quickly run you through those um starting with the temple itself you know the facade was built over a long period of time multiple changes you can see there's you know all sorts of elements which are not necessarily harmonious but broadly you know geometrically there are two modules so we thought let's work on those modules and we worked on a facade which uh, after clearing out the shops creates a continuous clean uh, you know uh, edge where the visitor enters through the ghantagar gate so that's the first bit which was done and you know we worked on elements of detail picking up from the existing buildings within the complex and then you know just build those in into this so there are a lot of little details i can't really go through those but it was great fun trying to you know pick up elements from the temple and blend them uh, once again into a facade which was perhaps you know uh, tampered with on many occasions so then again you know the darshini deity itself uh, putting in or or you know reinserting uh, elements of architecture which were clearly you know there or in other parts of the temple but was missing from here uh, looking at patterns like you know flooring materials traditional materials uh, and then of course you know the focus always being on the golden temple this contrast to the white and gold uh, beyond that you know just going to the facade this is what the facades look like when we started you know there's a complete chaos on all other all the other sides of the entrance plaza and then you know we had multiple ideas there's this you know skyline which was well shown in a very nice clean blue line here but very ragged otherwise and we thought you know let's look at how to tackle it so we thought of creating a screen in the front which is you know a double height screen hides things like dgs uh, the electric substations all that behind and then of course the facade that pops out we also actually thought that here we need to really tackle every bit of the facade put in elements or return you know return elements of traditional architecture onto those facades some things which had been knocked off or you know partly demolished we tried to reinsert so you know that's how multiple ideas came about the first thought was let's look at a brick background and a marble facade then there was this combination of brick and marble again and the multiple ideas uh, you know discussed with the client so this is how we started you know simple structure 
creating a screen all along the front. Um, then of course, uh, you know, this happened on all sides. Uh, and you know, these are the multiple modules we thought of working on. So finally we chose a module, which was the simplest actually. Um, and then, you know, of course, what it does is that when you stand at the golden temple, you now don't see, you know, these broken edges, but a clean edge, which makes, you know, uh, makes for a pleasant, uh, harmonious urban kind of experience. And, you know, one of the important elements was these smaller existing structures within the site. We always were trying to respond to those. So, you know, there's a small Udasin Chhatri, which, you know, uh, the client graciously wanted to keep and retain. So you made it an important element into, you know, into this entrance plaza, but also flanked it by other elements of similar nature. So, you know, tying it up more. Um, so this is what it looks like now, you know, of course, still, this is still an early stage where we started looking at the details of every single building and how we're going to treat every single structure around it. So a fair amount of, you know, effort gone in there to try and do, you know, practically every single facade, looking at every single bedroom and drawing room behind it and making sure it still works after we do our, you know, redesign of these facades. Um, so this is how it went about on all sides. And that's, you know, that's the final conception of how it looked. And, you know, of course, Mr. Basru did a really beautiful job of planning for the lighting. We also did a lot more other uh, lighting elements with, within this complex. Um, so at night, you know, of course, this is a, a well-known view of the complex. Everybody sees it on the net, but, uh, you know, there you are the whole entrance plaza in the front. Uh, then, you know, uh, and the, of course the gold is more visible in this, of course, within at the temple itself. Um, and this is how it looks like in the day, you know, when you kind of have a very clean, organized space, a serene space to come into rather than, you know, the complete clutter, which it was earlier. So, you know, again, if you look at the flooring, there's this whole pattern, which is picking up from, you know, what I talked of on the Fulkari, there's the, you know, the marble at the back, all the shops neatly integrated. It hardly looks like a space which you typically imagine on an Indian site. And, you know, down the back, you have all the buildings which have, you know, a treatment, which is not exactly what we imagined because a lot of, lot of the residents didn't really want uh, so many interventions, but we still tried to do something which was fairly interesting. Um, so this is what the space looks like, you know, clean, uh, tidy, uh, organized, and a, you know, more, than a, more important than all, you know, serene. I think that's what really works for it. And every edge, you know, streets coming in. So if you see in the left corner here, there is, uh, you know, a gateway which is leading in. So all the streets that were coming into this plaza were also integrated in here. And finally, you know, at night, of course, the lighting does its own magic. Uh, there is this whole, you know, uh, and the Golden Temple uh, particularly is alive till about four o'clock, even five people come in late. So this entrance plaza becomes a beautiful space to stay put in. Uh, you know, elements of the facade light, lit up, uh, do, do wonders for it. Uh, and, you know, the fountain in the middle, a small thing, it's really a very, very small gesture, but it's become really, really pleasant, uh, you know, for people to sit around it in the evening. So it's not really big things, but a lot of small details, which actually make up for, you know, the whole space. Um, of course, then we went on and did, you know, the facade itself. You can see the images of the before and after elements of the facade. Again, bringing that same character into the facade and the same materials and the same detailing. Um, and then the other part was a little interesting. I'll quickly run through this. Because, you know, we were looking at all these old buildings in Amritsar all around the streets. And uh, we kept on taking snaps and saying, wow, these are beautiful structures. Uh, you know, some really amazing elements, even Art Deco stuff, uh, and of course, older older stuff from, you know, uh, the late Mughal period prior to that too. Um, and, you know, if you look at the top, this is what we were seeing today. So, you know, that whole contrast of the, of the beauty of the form of some of these buildings and what we were trying to do to it today, covering it up with these signages, plastering it with, you know, ACP, knocking off all these beautiful buildings uh, was really hurtful. Uh, and here we thought, you know, let's try and talk to our client that why don't we try and improve these facades? And this was a tricky job, you know, because here you need to talk to every single owner behind every single window and tell him that, look, you know, we're going to get rid of this window of yours. So you're going to get rid of this massive bit of ACP you spent tons of money on, but you're still going to do, uh, you know, you're still going to get a more aesthetic and perhaps also a more functional and a more attractive space. Um, and, you know, because the entrance plaza was successful and the shops there started functioning, a lot of the shopkeepers here, at least the ground floor level, began imagining that, look, you know, perhaps we also need to do something to make our shops look traditional, make them look like they have some character and not, you know, 
the mess that they were at that point. So actually, the moment we got this ground level going, then people upstairs also, you know, slowly began to accept a change. And you know, you can see this is what we looked at above, and below is what we imagined we'll do. And you know, frankly, when we did this, I had serious doubt that we'll ever be able to manage it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we we had these guys on site, and really a lot of credit to our site team. Uh, you know, practically knocking on every single door, trying to ask people to listen to an architect explaining what we can do after ripping off half your front facade. Of course, we did a few interesting things. We told them that we do a waterproofing on their terraces. So, you know, we'll bring down pipes uh, from their roofs. So, you know, it actually was, a, you know, apart from just the facade, we were also trying to give them some benefit in terms of a functional benefit of this exercise. So that actually helped too. And plus, of course, the client made sure that, you know, we had, uh, you know, the administration constantly supporting on, on this, or us on this. That really did help. You know, so sometimes a bit of a stake is needed, but it was done very thoroughly uh, and I think with all gentleness, and that really did help. So these you are know, just ideas of you know how what looks like a really ugly building covered with you know posters can look like when you add elements of tradition to it using the same form. So you know we did this, and then this was a whole typology of elements which we kind of created in lighter weight materials, so that you know those buildings which don't crumble across if we insert heavy elements on them. We also imagined lighter weight treatments for these, uh, and then. You know, finally, this is what it looks like. The top is is what you have there, and the bottom of the screen is what it looks like today. Um, and you know, as a third party, it now seems magical, but it was great fun trying to you know do this um, and 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 getting you know individuals who otherwise don't believe in architects to try and accept that look, we can do something for the better, for otherwise what is urban sprawl. Uh, so you know, this is what the whole space looks like today. Uh, the streetscape, of course, was done by, you know, the, the flooring and some elements in the street furniture were done by a third architect uh, from uh, from Jaipur. But it's the vertical, you know, the, the elements of the facade, which, you know, completely changed the space. And that's what, you know, has really changed uh, that whole overall context of Amritsar. So this is what it looks like today. We even have a Middies, you know, which has traditional elements on it, uh, which uh, I don't think is terribly common. So that was an interesting little thing, yeah, you know, in here. So this is what the streets are now looking like. And, you know, this is then what leads into the entrance plaza. Though we started at the plaza and did the streets later, uh, in reverse is what, you know, most of pe most people who come to Amritsar see this as. It's, it's, it's great fun now. Uh, and that's why it's, you know, such an interesting space. I think I'll just stop here. And perhaps uh, Mr. Basroor can, you know, talk about the challenges of, of the lighting part of the temple as well as the other aspect. I have just given you a brief of what I can do. What a transformation, uh, Jay. It was absolutely brilliant. I mean, uh, what one can, you know, uh, the earlier impressions of Golden Temple and, you know, the entire premise, uh, I mean, I, I would call it totally to be a redevelopment project. Pra practically, the way it has been done, it looks as if the entire space has been re envisioned. And uh, I mean, the beauty is for everyone to see. And I'm sure what um, the impact of lighting now coming up, oh, I'm yeah. sure it's going to be the next splendor, the next splendor that, you know, uh, we as onlookers are in an absolute awe of. So looking forward to uh, the lighting, the, a very interesting part that is how you lit that space up, defining yeah. contours and overall, I mean, the impressions are absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. So over to you, Sardeep Ji. <clears throat> Thank you so much and wonderful presentation, Jay. I have been a part of this and I know the challenges which you guys face here. And when you said that uh, sometimes you thought that it would not be able, uh, it would not be possible, you're so right. I mean, <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was you and your team, they did a fantastic job. That's and uh, Mohiti, I'd also like to add here the way Jay has blended the modern uh, there are these modern elements which have been blended with the traditional element elements. That's that's something worth, you know, uh, going and believe, uh, uh, you know, experiencing that. There are these modern elements actually done beautifully there, and the way he's. Uh, I, I remember that the the chhatri in the in the front courtyard. Uh, and uh, which was an isolated piece. And then he created similar uh, uh, 
structures uh, around that, which really, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought neighborhood to that place and uh, that did not look out of out of place uh, uh, there. So it's it's actually fascinating. And these vertical spaces were tough to do, but uh, it's been a it's been a uh, effort a hundred times worthwhile. You know, so, can't agree more. Yes. <laughs> So you know, the other interesting bit I thought I'd, I'd mention, Mr. Basrood, perhaps uh, you, you, I'm sure you remember when we talked of those chhatris, and then we were talking about, you know, how to put in some element in the, or the on, on, of light in the plaza. Yeah. We also looked at these, you know, we talked of uh, bringing in these bronze elements, uh, lanterns, which we also put in on the plaza, which pick up from the same detail. Yeah. You know, it's different materials and workmanship, which actually, uh, you know, blends in to create that... Uh, you know, respectful atmosphere because we are respecting heritage here. And I think that was interesting. Uh, you know, those bronze elements also are some things which we thought, again, you know, right down the street, we have craftsmen who use, uh, you know, metal beating uh, as, as their livelihood. And so, you mm -hmm. know, they, they, those were the ones who actually did these bronze sheets and converted them into these beautiful, you know, uh, chhatris, which we then used as a light fixture. So, you know, trying to bring in local arts, it's been great fun, actually. It's been great fun. And uh, sometimes, I mean, it was a challenging task. And uh, sometimes you really feel that uh, there was a force behind you which uh, enabled you to complete this project. Because looking back, some of the uh, things were really challenging for both uh, Jay and me, I I'm sure. Yes. So I'll, I'll share my screen now. So the case study, we're going to cover the design considerations, the challenges, and the outcome. So I'll go through this very quickly. The design cons uh, considerations, of course, purifying. And, uh, we, were, we were asked to blend the routine lighting with the festival lighting. Uh, we, because the unorganized lighting, which was the festival lighting, was damaging the buildings. We were asked to clean up the mess these cables had been creating so visual comfort because it's a it's a uh, religious place people come for for some solemn times so visual comfort was very important so light pollution of course that was something which we wanted to do uh balance of lighting levels there were lots of dark spaces especially in the parakarma area uh, which were really not lit, they were not safe, and they really uh, did not look nice. So there were lots of dark spaces and then very bright spaces also. So we wanted to take care of them. We wanted the space to be cam uh, camera fr friendly, both for the pilgrims who would visit and uh, for for the uh, for the uh, telecasts and uh, TV telecasts and so on and so forth. So, and we were also asked to reduce the electrical load, which was fairly high at about 450 kilowatt for lighting, which we thought was, uh, was very, very high. We actually brought it down to about 100 kilowatt. So that was quite, a, quite an improvement. So the challenges were quite a bit. So it was a bustling complex. We did not want to intrude upon the, uh, the traditional architecture. Uh, and there were sentiment, uh, sentiments involved uh, of people. Everybody had their own aspirations and so many inputs from uh, uh, people. And because we did not want to intrude upon the buildings and we wanted the lights to be as, uh, you know, as minimal as possible. So there was a lot of customization of lighting fixtures uh, required. So, and then because we were uh, uh, doing the festival lighting, uh, we were building it, it in the uh, routine lighting. So there were uh, there were lighting controls required for the RGB fi uh, fixtures, and uh, this was probably the largest lighting control installation uh, for with DMX in India. Uh, I think it's still the largest. We controlled more than uh, ten thousand fixtures with a single control. So we wanted to bring that to a single point, uh, which was quite a challenge. Uh, safety was a challenge, of course, uh, for people who were working there. 
the areas were wet, and safety of the pilgrims was also to be considered. Okay, we started with the cleanup first, and the place was really messy. There were there were a whole lot of cables. There were other structures, the ACs, there were, uh, there were, and there were sports of these uh, uh, these cables. The lots of bamboos and poles hanging around. So we wanted to get rid of them. So that is where we started from. So this was quite an exercise because it had not been looked after for many, many years. And then we also had to clean up the lighting. This is what it looked like when we started the project. So the lighting was not uh, something to write home about at that time. And it was extremely glary. And if you can notice, um, it's not balanced. So there was no balance in the lighting. And uh, this is what it looked like before we started. And this is what we wanted to get get rid of, the decorative lighting for the festivals. So we that was also something which we wanted to start with. And uh, because every time they would install these lights, uh, they would damage the building, they would damage the golden structure, and a whole lot of problems uh, which these guys would cause, uh, cause there. And we wanted to get rid of that. This is one of the uh, pictures of uh, how it looked like when we started lighting up the uh, building temple. The, the lighting design, we started from the indoors of the Satchpan Sab, which is the main uh, temple itself, the golden temple. And uh, this is what uh, the pictures on the right of each uh, is what they look like. And on, uh, on, sorry, on the left is what it looked like. And on the right is what we thought it should look like. So these are uh, simulations. And uh, uh, this is how we uh, really approach that. We uh, hid all the fixtures. So if you see now, you don't see any uh, fixtures on, the, on, the, on these beautiful carvings and paintings which are on the main Sach Khan Sab. It's, it's been there for many, many years, and now they're properly highlighted and uh, without a single lighting fixture being visible. So that is what it looks like. So, and the second part was the outdoor lighting of the Sach Khansar, which is the actual golden temple. And because gold, gold reflects the light uh, and that lighting it uh, was a challenge because Every time you would point a light on top and it would give you reflections, which caused glare and which really did, did not look like uh, look nice. And uh, the picture on the right is a rendering, which we thought should uh, should be done. So we what we did was we bounced off the light from the water. So we aimed all the lights. Uh, there were these specially made narrow beam lights in Germany. And these lights were uh, bounced off the water onto the facade and then we were able to achieve this kind of a uh, illumination where the glare went off almost off, uh, completely and we were able to get a shimmering effect of the water the reflection of the water onto the building and the best part was that uh, with proper calculation we were able to uh, keep the water dark so that you get the entire reflection of the golden temple onto the water, which uh, looks really nice. Prakama was also a challenge uh, because uh, this is where most of the imbalance had existed. Uh, you can see your picture on your left, which is uh, which uh, uh, actually is fairly dark and uh, uh, not so great. So picture on the right is what we thought it should look like. So this is also a simulation. And which meant that we have one fixture with multiple optics uh, to get uh, get these multiple colors on the, uh, on the facade. So we lit up the uh, columns with lights which had three to five optics. So what you see here on, in, in the green light is not a, a, not a linear light which is pasted there. This has been achieved by uh, optics of the picture. So this is what, uh, after we installed, and uh, this, these are the mock-up stage, and you you can very clearly see uh, uh, the photograph on the uh, left corner, 
uh, how uh, multiple optics came into play. So there was the one fixture doing multiple jobs. So it was doing the blue and the white and uh, so and multiple colors. So and there were very precise optics which were created uh, from the factory and uh, there was a whole lot of customization which we had to go through at this stage. So this, these are again mock-up pictures while we were testing the lights and uh, then the facade lighting. Uh, there, was, there were so many elements which, uh, which uh, we had these recesses in, in these uh, arches uh, and so many other things which we wanted to highlight, including the domes. Uh, and uh, so we wanted the domes to actually you know, shine out. So, and domes normally become a challenge in lighting, especially when they're reflective. So we could not do it from a distance. So we installed the lights uh, uh, in a reverse manner. So they, uh, so they lit up the, uh, the domes from very close quarters, uh, I, I wish I had a I had a drawing how this was done, but mm -hmm. it was quite a challenge and quite a uh, quite a bit of customization. And you can also see uh, the beautiful facade of the uh, of the Darshini Dodi, uh, which was uh, uh, which was lit up, and uh, Jay created a wonderful uh, facade here, which was so actually it was made for lighting, and uh, Jay really did a. <laughs> there so uh, thank you for that and uh, 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 we have this dome and uh, now you can see the uh, see the red lights with uh, red lines which are actually the placement of the lights and these lights are lighting backwards so they're illuminating the dome uh, in in a manner where uh, you you can actually see the architectural detail of uh, of each uh, of these domes. So uh, this is what they look like now and uh, fairly uh, well lit. And uh, so this is what the outcome was. Uh, the Dashni Dori itself is not lit up because, uh, uh, sorry, the Ghantagar is not lit up because that uh, it was work in progress, but you can see uh, the view from the entrance plaza. This is the view from the Dashni Dori of the main uh, complex, and you can see the Kaltak Saab behind the Dashni Dori uh, from the Golden Temple. So this is what the Golden Temple uh, complex looks like now. And if you compare it with uh, what it was earlier, there's quite a bit of a change, and uh, people like it. So this is an image which most people have, and when you search you, this is what you get. So this is what it looks like. Thank you so much. Simply breathtaking, Mr. Basur, I should say, it's simply breathtaking. <laughs> so much of an effort has gone. I think it's a it's a brilliant teamwork. Uh, I, I think what what Jay talked about in such a pronounced manner. And the you know intricacies involved, and you know how every element uh, uh, within the facade it stands out, and I think it makes, uh, as you so rightly said, that you know by you know uh, throwing back the light. I mean the way you could, uh, I mean the architectural beauty could manifest. I think it's it's really manifesting beautifully. I mean the entire impact, all put together, is absolutely stunning. Is the word I, I should say. So uh, thank you so much, Mr. Basur and Jay, for this fabulous presentation. I'm sure the audience enjoyed this as much. And before we move to a very uh, interesting next round of panel discussion, we have an interesting AV for you. So keep watching and looking forward uh, to your inputs and any queries from the audience. Uh, we'd love to, to address them, but then again, uh, this is such an interesting discussion going on, such an interesting panel discussion to come now. Uh, please post your queries and all these experts, all the design luminaries here would uh, will definitely you know, respond to your queries and uh, looking forward to a great session. But again, before I move to the AV, I would like to thank our principal designers, Jack Artikar and, and uh, Savdi Basur from 
you send worldwide for a fabulous presentation thank you so much it's absolutely an honor having you on board with us thank you so much thank you thank you for having us thank you thank you so much The night sees a new avatar when lit up, showing us the cities of lights, creating an emotional bond with the citizens and visitors. Facade lighting has become a dream come true for the man-made structures. A welcoming hospitality building, an iconic heritage structure, powerful corporate headquarters, a happy retail complex, each structure expresses a different emotion and we at Jaguar Lighting help them shine through. A leader in complete bathroom solutions and now foraying in architectural and facade lighting in India. Right from project designing and planning stage to material supply and flawless execution. Our dedicated professional lighting simulation and design teams and project management teams pan India ensure top-notch quality and unmatched after-sales service. We not only use our lighting fixtures, but most importantly, use our lighting intelligence. Jaguar's smart and advanced LED lighting fixtures create artistic patterns, higher contrast, pleasant mood to build an attractive vibe for the city. Thank you viewers. As we join back to our next session, a panel discussion on a very interesting topic, judging a book by its cover, involving some prolific designers, facade lighting consultants, and an industry expert. Going through Ren and Martin, in our times we were, we were taught grammar rules to be rules. And yet at the same time we were told, exceptions are rule too. So while we have in our construct, never judge a book by its cover, but when it comes to facade lighting, we accept this adage with a little twist. Sometimes, and most exceptionally, we do judge a book by its cover. So as we unravel this interesting twist, I have designer Praveer Sethi from Studio Hinge, who is going to be the moderator for this session today evening. Welcome Praveer and a little brief about Praveer. Studio Hinge, uh, Praveer's design firm was founded in 2014 and the practice has since designed and executed works of scale ranging from furniture and lighting to interiors and architecture, having completed projects in Dubai, Pune and Mumbai. The outlook of the studio is firmly contemporary with acknowledgement of context, 
often providing a nod to the past. Good design to them is like a clever bit of storytelling. It is contextual, has a narrative, can be witty, moving or both. So over to you, Praveer, as we welcome and celebrated designers, Harmeet Singh, Pranit Nath, Tejas Joshi, and industry expert Gaurav Arora to this fo forum. Over to you, Praveer. Thank you so much for, for the introductions and the, and the kind words. Um, I'm just going to touch briefly on our panelists. I believe there'll be a more extensive biodata type introduction over social media, but I'd like to introduce Tejas to Doshi, lighting designer from Light and Beyond, uh, Harmeet Singh of Design Matrix, also lighting designer, Praneet Nath from Urban Studio, who's joining us as an architect today, and with us from Jaguar is their business head for architectural and facade lighting, Gaurav Arora. Um, Mohit, of course, needs no introduction, having made the introductions himself. So I'll jump straight into it. So um, we're here today to look at the topic, judging book by its cover, and as we think of this, it's easy to extend this metaphor to facades. So also in non-architectural terms, we speak of a person or an organization as putting up a facade of dash. You know, this could be a facade of, uh, of something that belies what is really within. You know, it's an outward proje projection that doesn't really tell us what's going on inside. I mean, of course, one is aware of the practical or even the aesthetic requirements of lighting a building, for example, you know, we, we try to highlight textures, we try to bring forth architectural features and ornament, um, we try to, to, to show depth in three dimensions. Um, but I'd like to focus on the softer, more intangible side of this requirement, which is how hard is it or how does one represent an abstract idea or a concept via the lighting of a facade? And I'll give a brief example from my end just to get the ball rolling, but uh, an institution such as the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India, wants to convey ideas of solidity, security, and stability. And this can be done through architecture, but how does lighting provide that additional layer? Um, a building such as a performing arts center, for example, would have a completely different requirement to project an image of, uh, of experimental or artistic inquiry. Now, to my mind, that's quite challenging. So I'd really love to hear your views on how, how we can get these very softer, non-tangible concepts or abstract ideas through, through lighting. Uh, if we can start with you, Tejas. Thank you, Praveenji. There are many ways of doing such facade lighting. In 2017, uh, we have lit Eastern India's tallest residential tower uh, named the 42 in Tricolor for the Independence Day, when the building was still under construction. The idea was to convey the message uh, to public in silence. We wanted the light to communicate. So we used 370 plus lights for the installation. For Kolkatans, uh, this is like a Buj Khalifa, you know. So we made sure that the tower was visible from after the sunset from every corner of Kolkata. So we did start the trend uh, way back in 2017 in the city and now every uh, Independence Day or Republic Day, most of the buildings are lit in tricolor. Likewise, for RBI, one can use video, uh, video projection technique to convey the message. It could be, you know, projection of a, a new note coming out, uh, maybe a flag, maybe a tricolor. I mean, whatever they want to convey, you can convey through a video projection uh, technique, uh, which is also known as video. Uh, projection mapping. Having said that, I personally feel that one should do it if there is a need uh, for it or if it is justifying the architecture and the cause. You know, in India, uh, we tend to overlit buildings we, and use RGB color changing lights everywhere. I understand. The Indians love colors. We, we love bright ambience, right? Uh, however, I feel it doesn't suit our architecture. So, for example, uh, let me think. Uh, do you see uh, such RGB colored light installations in any of the government buildings in Europe on permanent basis? I don't think so. Because 
it somehow doesn't suit their architecture once in a while if they do projection mapping it is fine but uh, that is also not viable in long run so it's highly recommended that whenever such structure is made or conceptualized one needs to involve a professional lighting designer during the conceptual stage itself you know then a lighting designer professional lighting designer would foresee and preplan for different kind of events in future depending on what kind of structure it is what purpose it is etc so um, i'll pass over the question to hermit from design matrix I mean, as a lighting designer, how does one deal with or grapple with these kind of abstract ideas to be represented on a facade? So, Praveen, thank you for uh, asking this. It's it's a very interesting dialogue which we ourselves, designers, together with architects, are having all the time. So, what is we? First of all, always there is a context where we build a facade lighting, which is as a responsibility of lighting designer or any other designer would be there. uh having said but also what is happening is it's becoming a billboard ish which is which is a challenge which is coming up more and more in the industry and more and more in the context form of it so as you said rbi when you want to show the strength that's that's a part of it which is which is very relevant but at the same time when you start flashing your logos and rbi on together onto it it's becoming another signage so we have done couple of projects and presented in in a very different uh, ways of doing this abstractly like one of the projects which we designed uh, which never happened what we gave was uh, the facade was known to be the happiness quotient of the uh, pune it was a pune project and it was called happiness quotient of pune so what we did was we created a system in which all the city as well as the visitors in that block can communicate via tabs via phones via things and decide what color it is and right. that was published so what you do is when you give a context to something it it becomes more and more relevant and it has better life to it so that's one one thing which we did and another project which we ngmc we we, we presented here in delhi which is an art place so what we did was actually created uh used projections as tejas was mentioning and uh, is is going to mention a little more so what we what we what we did was we took that and created a collaborative art system in which there was a dashboards and screens where actually couple of designers can come in and start creating an art on the facade so it is dynamic it is not constant mm-hmm. and it is possible to engage with cities so that's another context which we can create and sometimes but again uh, it's it it has to start with is it facade for lighting or lighting for facade that's the first question as a designers as a as a collaborative team because we we as lighting designers only come in after the building is conceived after architect has thought about it and it's very important to carry that through the project and not every project is going to allow you to do this so this is this is something which is integral approach and uh, it will only come by a discussion by a collaboration by uh, you know a contribution of thoughts between between the designers and then we will come to it first question is art a facade for lighting or lighting for facade as we also say architecture for lighting or lighting for architecture generally we as lighting designers have to bring in the architecture at night so that is our role most of the projects but by the technology by the need by overwhelming uh, visual world which is it is becoming what we are doing is we are more and more get, get becoming graphic and that is what is happening now the facades are created for the lighting which is a newer right. so that's pretty much which i i would like to contribute to it okay thanks for that i think there's there's a number of starting points that i found that i could tangentially take off from there but i do need to get to the next uh, so if so if you could jump to pranit um pranit i'll just bounce the same question off you how how do you go about presenting or or, or constructing or displaying an abstract idea on a facade using light it's a tricky one yeah i mean for us uh... you know lighting with the with the tech that's available now you can do crazy things right and uh, so it's not just about that it, it used to be when it came out as a novelty 
uh, thing, right? But now that's gone. You've seen this all over the world as tech gets better and cheaper and what can be done really. And uh, as uh, Harmeet was saying, yeah, it's completely relevant facade for lighting or lighting for facade. But lighting now, light is a material, right? I mean, really, it's, it, it is a new material with the, with the tech uh, that's there. So for yeah. us, what's important is not just, uh, you know, do lighting or, mm-hmm. the, or the tech for the sake of it, but uh, I mean, of uh, how do you curate the mood of the building, right? Of what it kind of projects. In the end, that's the facade that what uh, what it, that projects uh, onto the city, uh, onto what uh, what the program is inside that building, right? So for for that, that's extremely important for us. So it doesn't matter really that yeah, it has dynamic, it's color change, it can project, it can do all this, you know, all of that. But then that can happen. That's great, right? Uh, but the real uh, long-lasting uh, design factor, I mean, that that uh, excites us would be that really, how do you curate the mood using the tech? And that mm-hmm. really can, and that really, it's, it's not the effect of it, it's the affect of it. It's, it's the effect of on, on the mind, right? It's not the effect, just the visual mm-hmm. effect. So I think that's something that's, uh, that we are very, like we have done that on an interior level. Uh, uh, very little bit on an exterior level, but we're just yeah. kind of beginning to do that. But we we've done that a lot uh, on the interior, on, on interior meaning and architectural level. Right? Yeah, I think for but us, it's spatial. I, I suppose as an architect, I mean, your 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 job is to give a crystal clear brief to a lighting designer if there is one involved in the project, and hopefully, you know, that this is the kind of mood or this is the kind of ethos that I want, or this is the abstract yeah, yeah, concept that I wish yeah, to convey, yeah, and then. Yeah. You know, so so your part of it would be to, to crystallize that brief to the lighting designer. I mean, anywhere design. in the world, when you see good design, it's not about architectural design, landscape design, interior design, the lighting design. It's all one. Right? Yeah. Design yeah. All, so it's all connected uh, for, yeah, visually, right? I mean, it's all connected in, in the design uh, ethos. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, over to our resident industry expert. So, Gaurav, if you can shed some light on this. I've been waiting to use that to the whole time. Absolutely. I think it was very well summarized by our major in Pranit Jay. And um, I would like to add that I feel, yes, we can use facade lighting effectively to achieve or convey the ideas of solidarity and to an extent, security and stability as well. If you take the example of China, uh, they use the concept of media facade, which can obviously be used for commercial purposes as well as uh, it was effectively utilized by them, for example, during the 70th anniversary celebration and more so uh, post March of 2020, uh, post the coronavirus outbreak, they used dynamic media facades on various buildings across cities to display messages of empathy, starting with the city of Wuhan. And uh, they use these buildings to create powerful images of hope and solidarity. Later on, other countries also followed suit with uh, the UAE and Egypt also lighting up their iconic structures in support uh, to China for the outbreak. And uh, it wasn't just the buildings, it was also uh, the other structures like the Sheikh Zayed Bridge amongst others. So there is definitely a way to achieve those emotions through the effective use of facade lighting. Great. Thanks very much. Um, if I may, I'd like to jump to individual questions, which I think are, are a little more tailored to the kind of work which our panelists are into. Um, so I mean, if we start with you again, um, the little work that I do know of design matrix seems to be punctuated with very interesting forays into installation design and, and light art space. And you know, it's very interesting because we need just spoke of light being as a, a material in, in itself rather than something that is layered over to highlight materials. And as I understand, that's a lot of the basis of the, the whole light space art movement. Um, have you had the opportunity, and I think you've partially already answered this question in your first answer, but could you tell us a little bit more about the opportunities to explore these themes while lighting building facade? I mean, you've spoken of something that is interactive in a couple of instances. Um, you know, could you could you elaborate a little bit on that, on this sense of play or delight or or even ownership? I would suspect that the, that the general public or, or indeed anybody who has a tab or a device that is linked in and can... Uh, you know, can it can influence whether it's the color, the intensity, the CR, whatever. So, um, 
I, I'll let you speak on that. So, so yeah, uh, Prambir, uh, it's 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 we we are very serious lighting designers and come from a for a from a school where we work for architecture. And for, I would say, although I come from an electronics and communication background, a very misfit in this whole scenario, which you will see. But having said, we learned lighting as a element which was uh, bringing the graciousness of the building at night. That's, that's how it was always for the architecture. And mm -hmm. for very long, you know, in like, I would say 17 years or 18 years of my practice, I've been doing this 10 years. I used to do this. This is this is what was the core principle of doing it. Getting yeah. a brief from an architect and architect then explaining the architecture, what he wants to reveal at night and what we want mm -hmm. to show at night. So that's, that was the context to it. Sure. In the last five to seven years, and even though I would say, in fact, one of the first media facade presentation I remember I did almost 19 years back, which is, which is in my earlier than this, this practice itself. And uh, when the buildings, ma building material, as, as uh, Pronet also said, it's, it's become a material now, which is, which is what architects have been demanding to us as well, to how to integrate that into the building and how to mm -hmm. make it a part of the architecture rather than being something bringing out that architecture, which is there. So it's becoming a part of the architecture than just glorifying the architecture. So that's... Yes. that's change which has happened. Now, when it comes to that stage, even the responsibility becomes very heavy as, 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 as for us. So what, ha what is happening is just like uh, there is a reason of materiality or materials which are used in that zone or in that context, same way lighting has to be doing that also. And being flexible is very dangerous. It's, it's, it, it can do more harm to, to the context more harm to the to the whole uh, psychology of that whole so what it has to bring in so all that is so we we have a little more responsibility as well towards it. so having said uh, whenever we try and present as i said before also what we try and do is conceptually we want to create some context to it which is like as I said, if we have to use color, then we might have uh, might use it as a as a happiness quotient or a link it with somebody. As bad as that, you know, the algorithm also defined, which was written by me, as that in case there is a bomb blast or in case there is a mishappening in the city, it goes white. So these kind of sensibilities mm. have to be adapted to it because you, mm. you, you, when you, when you have a tool, which you want to communicate with, then you have to become responsible as well. Same goes yes. with, with the other, other bit, when you are uh, planning of an art, then you have to put an algorithm of uh, sensor as well with it, because uh, you know, it's in public, it's public art and you are yeah. into a sensitive kind country where we are, our sensibilities are very different. We want to uh, want our kids to not see something and want, want two kids to not use some words. So we, we need to adapt to all that and which is also a responsibility which we carry with it. So yes, in every project, we try and see where is the potential of doing it. And sometimes as bad as that, a lot of projects we have gone in and said, there is no more facade lighting onto it because uh, I think we want to reveal the interiors in that because it's a glass building and it's a lovely interior. So you want to see that more and try and get the visual clutter reduced into the facade rather than seeing when you're swinging through a building and you're seeing a lot of downlight shining in your eyes because it's a glass building. Let the people see that. So again, uh, now it comes out to be, I can create or we can create, I would say as with, together with architects, a veil so that you don't look inside the building it's very simple principle of Pepper's Ghost, which is olden days we used to use on our, on our, on our stage uh, events and bit of it. You make spaces very dark with a very bright space in front of it. So what you do is you frame it. You don't let the eye see through it. Mm. At the same time, sometimes you don't do the lighting. You want the people to see inside. So all that is, is, is something which evolves all together with architects, architects, interior designers on the project and look at it, how it is, it is all sitting into the context. So uh, I would like to sum it up with, we are being made more and more responsible as facade lighting designers. And uh, 
we also have a lot of power which is coming with responsibility so that's 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 a broad bit to it thank you but harmeet do you want to finally judge a book by its cover or not you have to be more specific and open ah well Sorry for I, interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> i i i put it like that ki, you know for sad lighting you know whenever i this is the the discussion which i which i have very often with my clients i always say them that why are you doing it do you really want to do it uh, because it's the biggest waste of energy it's <laughs> biggest waste of money and uh, why what is the reason of doing it so when the reason and reason is what it starts to uh, look like and what is what is it going to create a brief and then going to be created as a design so uh you know a lot, lot of time i ask them how big is your ego because most of the time the facade lighting design is just a ego design it's nothing more than that if you really see it's 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 something uh you know it's very critical to balance that and ask the clients who half the time they want to do some lovely stuff but not afford it so it's it's a judging the book by the cover by ourselves at that moment when we are having the brief most of the time so we we also need to judge that that's that's <laughs> what happens surely nice all right um pranit next one to you is uh, one of your earliest works shatranj nakoli which we know from the days when we were young and used to go out in banda a lot uh, is one of the pioneers of kinetic lighting design schemes in the country so as you pointed out yourself the tech has obviously evolved you know quite exponentially since then I was curious to know if you are exploring this kind of technology in any of your current or upcoming projects, and you know what sort of potential do you see for dynamic or smart lighting? Um, you know, we all know how it can be used in an interior context. I think we're all quite familiar from the automation mood settings and so on. But on a facade, and I think there's definitely an overlap to what Harmeet's just spoken about. But if you could care to share with us your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. This was actually my first project. Ah. Uh, I was still studying then. Uh, right. I was very lucky to get that. I was uh, still studying in London uh, at the time, and I was coming up and down to finish this. Uh, we did that because we could, you know, at that time. Yeah. Uh, it was the first uh, project uh, that used kinetic uh, lighting, uh, but looking at so so many other projects, I think it was still done sensitively. but by accident right it was just at that point because we realized that it's mm. not about mm. uh, it's not about the like for example it's not about the color change it's about the mood that the color brings for every space right i mean that's that's really the trick uh, of the designer uh, for us that happened as as very uh, as uh, very momentary lapses as an accident but that was the big learning for us uh, after that uh, project and for ever since then like we've tried to avoid just using like you know color change because you can i mean a lot of people do it because they can because the tech is there and you can do it you know so that's the thing i mean uh, most of dubai and china are that right i mean if you see all the all the buildings they have the money they have the tech they can do it they'll do it uh, the real trick is that you know how do you do it with minimal resources and how what do you actually portray after having that tech uh, sure. as well so i mean after that we did a lot of experiments with uh, then uh, again with interiors but again uh, still related to perception in the end it's all perception right uh, of of what it uh, or what it conveys so after that we did a lot of lighting that's uh, that's dynamically uh, uh, integrated with sound you know uh, for for a space so that the the light the dimming mm. the pulsing all the effects of light are related i mean are directly uh, kind of uh, linked Uh, with the sound and to control right. the mood so that means you have a perception of visual and sound connected uh, i think if this is in an interior and not a facade context in an interior but uh, after it'd that, be quite exciting to imagine like the street sounds influencing the lighting yeah. on a on exactly. a facade as well exactly you can so see harmeet uh, rubbing yeah. his hands together about the yeah. algorithmic possibilities that that throws up <laughs> the tech is the same after that we also then we did uh, we moved on to projections because that's the new thing we've been trying to do projections since the last 20 years since we were a student but we never had the tech and it was never yeah. possible in terms of shots of projection projection projectors and the uh, costings and all of that now it is and we did a uh, we did a fair bit of that but the whole trick of that is not that's the whole thing right the whole trick of those kind of things is not 
the tech that you're using that you can use. It's the content that you generate to project. That mm-hmm. really is the trick, you know, and that is really the thing. It's not that I've put something and now I have to put anything. Or a lot of people do that, you know, because it's, it's very difficult to generate content uh, mm-hmm. to, uh, to do that. Same thing for the facades, right? So it's not, it's one thing to, uh, to work with a lighting designer, work with a lighting company to help you with the, the technology and to help create the mood. You also have to work with a lot of content generators to actually generate and project that content because what happens is the content really curates the mood. You know, mm-hmm. so you've seen that. I mean, you've seen like, you've seen classic movies like Blade Runner when we were growing up, Blade Runner part two. If you see these movies, the iconic, uh, you know, uh, cinematographic uh, scenes, right? Which are completely curated by lighting. Um, yeah. Uh, if you if you see that, so uh, you know into that, then it's all about the it's all about the content. Coming back to facade again, it's again about so today the tech enables you to do all kinds of things, but in the end, it's up to the designer to really curate the mood with the content, and that is uh, that is the real trick. I, I, you know that's and that's that is uh, that's that requires another level of expertise, either from the designer or you hire someone else or you work yep. with somebody else to, to do that. So, I mean, in that journey, we we have kind of uh, learned that, and it's all about the emotion in the end. In the end, it's all this tech, uh, right? All that you can do, it's all about the emotion of what it, what the facade really projects. And yeah, in a sense, it comes back to judging a book by itself. Yes, I mean, for for architects' eyes, you know, we look at things differently. So we will not judge a book by its cover inherently. We'll try and look at it and you know, we know exactly what the other architect is thinking, what went wrong, what went right. We, you, you can really read the whole story. But for everyone else, if you don't get it in three seconds, you don't get it, right? That's the thing, yeah. you're judged. You're judged immediately. Yeah. You know? So that's, that's also- and That's a particularly, particularly true in a, in a world where attention spans are shrinking every day. Exactly, right? right? So that's- yeah. uh, Great. So okay. I mean, so um, which the thing is coming back to that, like, you know, again, you know, so like going back to uh, large cultural influences, like movies will be like Blade Runners. Uh, I mean, if, you, if yeah. you've seen that, you know, as far as how cities and the lighting, light pollution, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as they just was uh, mentioning, you know, uh, all of that. Uh, again, there are uh, beautiful uh, firms like Team Lab, you know, from Japan, they're all about the content, but with the tech, I mean, it's just amazingly beautiful of how they use lighting, uh, mm-hmm. but you don't know that they're using lighting. You don't know the tech behind it because the content is just so beautifully done, right? And they really kind of immerse you uh, into that yeah. uh, thing. Yeah. So, I mean, but also going back to in the early in the early years, right? When there was no tech, you know, there were people like Peter Rice using giant mirrors to reflect moonlight and use moonlight for large, uh, for a large amphitheater lighting, right on the outside, yeah. you know, this is beautiful, right? I mean, that sense. So, I mean, just in that, in that mode, it was all about the emotion uh, of what you want to convey, right? And only the tech has changed now over the years. So. Sure. Great, thank you. Um, over to you, Gaurav, and this is a one right up your alley. But as a leading homegrown lighting solutions provider in India. What are some of the more pressing or recurring technical issues that jackers have to deal with in satisfying demands which are, uh, or requirements which are more and more demanding, let's say, um, from lighting designers, from architects? So what are some of these issues that occur? How do you address these? And if we could also learn a little bit about your company's efforts towards r and I realize that I've sneakily put in three questions in one there, but uh, would appreciate your thoughts. Sure thing. So uh, from a designer's perspective, there are multiple challenges that we deal with on an ongoing basis. Um, see, more than close to 80% of our product portfolio for the architectural and facade range is customized. We, for every project, we have to uh, challenge ourselves and develop newer products. Basically, we have requirements of anti-glare solutions. We have requirements of select selective adjustable optics for certain projects. Uh, In certain projects, heritage uh, structures and the like, we have a demand to customize the products to match the texture of the color of the facade stone. And Mm -hmm. uh, 
when we work with, uh, we are currently working with some projects with ASI, you know, the Archaeological Survey of India that manages sure. monuments and such. That comes with its own unique set of challenges in terms of how uh, your fixtures can be placed, how the cabling can be done and such. And that poses new and unique challenges as well. So the advantage of uh, Jaguar is that we have built up this vertical with a very holistic view. We are not into pushing product. We have identified a vacuum within this space wherein most of the companies in India are either doing extremely entry level solutions or, they are, or you have the uh, absolutely premium European brands competing in this space. We have tried to latch ourselves somewhere in between where we try to offer the very best industry standard products. We designed to compete with the European and North American counterparts. And we have our own in-house programming teams. We have a project management team, a site supervision team. So there are certain projects that we have done in tandem with departments where we have given them complete end-to-end -end execution capability. So single point of contact for, from the company, which is a slightly different take because in these projects, uh, I mean, they were conceived and designed by designers. Obviously, the BOQs were provided to us, and then we worked on them. But a lot of the competencies also depends on the programming. If it's a DMX-based solution, it depends on how well the, the solution is programmed in terms of achieving the wow factor and the effect that's desired out of it. So that is where we are trying to create a unique value add in terms of how we go to market. Great. Thank you. Um, just jumping back to a question that I think could be relevant to everyone. Uh, so I'll throw it open to everyone on my one. But, um, you know, it occurs that the lighting is quite a nascent discipline in the country. There's, a not, there's, there's not too many buildings in India that we see with the facades lit. And even fewer amongst these are lit by actually qualified lighting designers. So, you know, how would you guys who represent, you know, intellectuals, but also professionals in the field of architecture and lighting design, you know, how do we uh, go about raising an awareness level of what good lighting can achieve? I mean, not just with other professionals, so we're not preaching to the choir, but also to raise the awareness with clients who potentially commission these buildings, but also with the public at large, so that, you know, there's an awareness of what good lighting can actually do for the public realm. Um, if we can start with Amit. I think in last 17 years, we've seen a very, very big growth in our, in our own uh, selves as well, as well as the industry by itself. More and more projects, uh, RFPs, the proposals or project management companies are asking for lighting designers now. Which is, a, which, a good, which is a good point to start with. And also many architects have started very strongly collaborating with us to build something unique, which has uh, integral capability of looking great in the daytime and transforming at the night, nighttime into something else, or probably hiding all, all those things which they, they do not want to reveal at night. So it's, 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 it's improving every day. That's, that's yeah. what I would say. But Having said, uh, it's a very challenging situation for, for us as a lighting designers, if you will see. So what is happening is there is a free of cost consultancy being provided by all, most all the manufacturers, which is, which is part of the uh, mm -hmm. giving as a add value addition to their projects, which is fine, which is which is, uh, uh, has been happening globally. It's, it's not something which is happening in India. But at the sure. same time, what happens is a lot of people have realized that the kind of neutrality we can bring in sometimes to choose from various brands and put it together to create an economy as Pranit touched about, about also. Sure. So which is, which is also relevant. So creating economy and picking the right product for a right specification and right domain into it, bringing all that put together as well as also discussing at the context level with the building as, as a designers, because we, 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 most of us, I am not, but most of, of the lighting designers and architects and interior designers graduated to become lighting designers. I'm a 
I am a, I, I call myself as illiterate lighting designer. I will learn on job. So that's, that's what uh, has been my career onto it. But my team is all of them. In fact, I'm the leftover engineer in my team. Most of them are architects and interior designers who have graduated to become uh, right. lighting designers. So what is happening is now the, the offering is very interesting. What is happening is we are discussing at the concept and content level as as and and on also to the context level which is which is what because of the education of an architect which brings in and then graduating to create technical compli technically complicated compositions which are by dmx projection we are all aware of this technology in fact in our team we do not leave any drawing which is not explaining how it needs to be controlled we do not ask the lighting control supplier to give any drawings to anybody. We give those drawings. We just put it together. There is enough information which is transferred to our uh, electrical consultants to take over from there for putting the things together. Mm -hmm. And then creating a platform for economy to compete with two or three brands and get to the right one. So which is, which is what we bring in. So as a, as a whole thing, there is enough value proposition which has been brought in by us. And uh, most of the time, I'll tell you, it, it is not in terms of the cost. It's more softer bit of it, which I would say. Mostly, in fact, we are uh, blamed of a fact that we make the project expensive. But that is there is a reason for it. Our benchmarks are too low. We have been working with reflectors which are actually beaten patilas. For a while sorry for my language but that's 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 what we have it has changed to very very dramatically different kind of efficiency what we're talking about and different level of technology i can give you a very small point if you drive led at a lower current your efficiency increases by 30 to 40 percent but everybody is driving at a higher current because the cost of cost per lumen reduces that way mm -hmm. but as an overall technology, but all these we're talking facts, of capex cost versus life cycle cost. No, uh, capex, yes, you're right on on, mm -hmm. on that account. That is that is what it is, and also looking at the life of the equipment, everything. So what I'm trying to say is, we need to get into these detailed discussions, and this will also elevate the industry. Right now, I think uh, Gaurav and Mohit both both can check into it. Half the time they are competing with the cost, not with the quality. Mm -hmm. Even if they want to provide quality today, but still, the they 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 have to manage it in the cost, which is way 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 too low as per as when compared to the international brands and quality what they are producing. So I think this bit of uh, uh, problem solving and also does not let us bring in value proposition in terms of money. It's a cash twenty two, all all yeah. around. Because what is happening is we specify a quality. We specify a specification which takes up the cost a little higher. So lack, lack of standards, lack of issues, lack of understanding. You know, same guy sometimes, you know, enough times I think uh, all of us have been aware of a product which is sold at about 100 rupees and there is another product which is sold at 1000 rupees also. And if you ask me, there is a place for 1000 rupees and there is a place for 10, uh, 100 rupees also. So it's improving every day. And uh, we are getting our share and we are also mm. been holded responsible for what we are delivering. So that's a good sign for us to move towards. Thank you. Um, Praneet, any thoughts on how to raise public awareness on what good lighting can do? Yeah, I mean, good lighting can do a lot, can do magic. And uh, I mean, just a very quick example, you know, uh, Joe Beach, you know, I stay on the beach and they've done uh, the lighting of Jew Beach. Uh, they've really spent money. They've yeah. done like, gobo projections on the sand and on the water. Yeah. Color change, uh, uh, you know, those bright lit sails, uh, which are in fiberglass and, you know, all of that. So it's, it's one thing to, yeah, where they had the budget and they could have actually done real magic with that budget, but it's just super jarring, right? I mean, and that's, mm. uh, it's actually killed the mood of the beach in the evenings, right? You don't mm. actually even see the moonlight, right? Or the, mm. the moonlight mm. on the beach. The whole idea was to have lighting, but you still know that is your you're in the night. Yeah. So you have yeah. you're in the night on the beach, 
right? Which is um, is a magical thing, and you've actually killed it. And there's also that so much light pollution around for all the other buildings around and all of that. Right. And they've spent the money. I mean, it's public money, right? It's, uh, it's so in that sense, uh, yeah, it needs to. But that awareness has to come in in terms of, and I think yeah. that also I think that also happened because. Somehow it's also in the te in the technique of uh, bidding and the technique of uh, visualizing, right? Uh, yeah. In, in that sense of, of doing that, and that's where lighting companies come in or uh, lighting designers come in or whatever, because you know today the, the visualizations have become so strong that you know yeah. uh, the those things. I mean, today where where vis that's a separate uh, tangent, but where vis where visualization is going. Uh, it's not a, it's not about hyper realistic, but it's also about that that is essentially is your building, right? I mean that it shows you everything, right? In, in that sense, yeah. uh, there are a lot of visual uh, visual artists, architects, right? Designers mm -hmm. who who their portfolio is just digital, right? Yeah. And it's a very relevant uh, field. It doesn't have to be bricks and mortar anymore. But my point is that. Uh, it needs to be visualized, uh, and we have that tech. It's so easy; we can do it in our offices. You know, it's all it's all that. So, uh, in that sense, that's that's not the the process is not. Yeah. Being Everyone's just so excited that we have the budget now and we have this project. Let's just put everything in. You know, so that's like. The I think that the the Joe Beach example was a good one because I live right by Marine Drive in Bombay as well, and uh, you know, I, I don't know if you're aware, but there was a big hue and cry when they changed all the lights on the Queen's necklace. Because, uh, and most people you speak to as laymen, they don't know what it was. They were just, uh, they don't know why they were complaining. And of course, it was the color temperature for, for most of us who would know that. And I suspect that means you give me six other reasons as well why why they complain. But largely, you know, everyone said, yeah, you know, it's not bluish, it's not yellow. Like, and that was it. Of course. You know, but there was enough, there was enough for a citizen's movement. And they actually are pleased to say they trained all the lights. And not only was the question of color temperature this, but also that of glare, you know, yeah. because they are, because the lights had initially installed a very glare. I mean, you couldn't see the road for the lights, you know. And, and, and we've all come across appallingly bad examples of, of, well, I, I suspect there's not even a designer involved in such examples, but uh, it's nice to see communities stepping up and putting a foot forward. So, so you know, we do hold out hope. And, and then I pass the baton over to, to Gaurav, who I think for you is probably, um, I think that, that the mantle of upping the, the game of lighting design awareness, well, of course, you guys have a lot to gain from that. But in terms of as a social service, I mean, I think of I think of firms abroad, and I think of stuff they do with you know continuing professional development. And could it be something? You know, could there be initiatives that Rafa could do to actually go into studios, educate architects, educate interior designers, you know, get them to understand what good lighting is. And of course, the payback for you guys is is pretty obvious that they'll start specking products which are obviously um, you know more tailored to their requirements. It makes your job easier. Hopefully, increase into revenues. So, you know, is there, are there ideas like that of put at Chakwar or, or anything that you'd like to throw in personally in terms of how to raise this awareness? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I, uh, what I was saying is yes. I think that overall, even though lighting design as such, I feel is in its infancy, Overall, I mean, it's not a very, uh, uh, it's a few decades old and uh, yep. even more so in emerging markets such as India when compared to the West, but we still have a tremendously accomplished pool of Indian designers who managed to make a mark, not just on a national level, but to an extent on an international level as well. A few who we have on board today with us as panelists and as a responsible product company, we try to interface with the best lighting design professionals in the industry and work mm -hmm. along to help them achieve their vision for the projects. Yeah. Now in some cases, obviously for smaller projects for you know, uh, interior design, where we are doing small apartments and such, where there we work in tandem. For that, we use our in-house lighting team. We have a few uh, certified designers who work on dialects and various tools who work as an extension of the architect's team to give them a basic lighting design capability, but we are very clear on what we can provide and what we can't. We do not mm -hmm. try to replicate or replace the work of a lighting designer. It's very important to be very clear on that. And um, 
there are three ways where we work with lighting designers. In some cases, the designers are brought on board by the clients themselves, where we interface with them and work with them, like I mentioned previously. In other cases, we refer lighting designers to clients. There are various government departments like ASI, there are monument projects that we are invited to consult on and actually uh, design the solutions for, but we are very clear mm -hmm. that we'd rather have a professional lighting designer involved. So, so we share their profile with the various departments. Nice. Yeah. Then yeah. we get onboarding process because it ultimately there is a sanctity to the project that needs to be maintained. All of these professionals come with sure. a body of work. None of that can be replicated in house by a product company, and we understand that. We want to be socially responsible that way. And there are other, there are certain projects in which we choose to partner with lighting designers, where we choose to bring them on board as part of our team and bid together for larger contracts. Yeah. Yeah. So multiple ways that we try to interface and work in collaboration rather rather than creating a competition or a replacement. Okay. So this and apart. Is like I already previously mentioned, what we try to create as a value addition from our side is on the project management, site supervision, programming support, and all of that, where, mm -hmm. which is seen as a value addition from a lighting designer's perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that, Barav. Um, okay, um, thanks for that on the raising of awareness of lighting and good lighting design. It also does strike me, and this, this would be an open question uh, thrown to the three of you, and it's a very simple yes or no one, but are there institutes in India which are teaching lighting design? Because I'm not aware of any. I don't know schools where one can go and qualify as a lighting designer in India. And Mitri, is that, is that something that, that you're aware of? So uh, there are elimination design courses available which right. has the, you know, design is a bigger perspective. It has a right brain and a left brain activity. So, yes. you know, certain institutes in India are trying to do some bit of uh, uh, training, or I would say education in terms of illumination design, engineering bit of it. Mm -hmm. But as a mm -hmm. whole lighting design course, I don't think anything is available in India okay. as such, which could be uh, relevant and credible. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Okay, um, a last common question, which I'd like to go again one by one between the three of you gentlemen is, um, you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking of a park near where I live in, in Kalaba in Bombay, where uh, there are kids studying under their T5, you know, not I think they're not even LEDs now, but they're T5 batons, you know, under this sort of uh, corrugated tin roof and. You know, I'm not sure that was the intended purpose of it, but it was observed that kids were studying there and then they converted it into a study center. So, so you know, kids study there at 12 and 1 at night, and these are probably kids who don't have uh, the resources of a study desk or uh, maybe even stable electricity at home, right? Or I'm thinking of a pavement dwelling family uh, which is gathering around cooking an evening meal on a footpath in Worli, which happens to be lit from... Uh, a landscape light or a street light that an upscale residential building has installed. And you know, both these are very accidental and, and sort of happy byproducts of a lighting scheme that, that I feel unwittingly addresses the needs of, of underprivileged in our city. And you know, the question that I'm coming to is that as we have a regulatory framework that is also like the discipline itself still in its in, in its formative or, or infancy years even. Um, you know, could this framework be developed um, to to have a social or a public service agenda kind of hardwired into it, such that any lighting scheme that affects the exterior or facade of a building above a certain scale will have certain obligation to to do something that is of social um, benefit as well to the community around. You know. Okay. Has, are, are there things like this happening? Could they happen? What are your thoughts on this? I mean, we start with you again, Henry. I I haven't heard anything uh, like that happening, but what I closest uh, find is Singapore has a very interesting norm. If you light up your facade, you are given some incentives onto it. Uh, that being, being the city being smaller, so what right. happened was it contributes to the street very strongly and which leads to a lot of help in the in the overall context mm -hmm. but having said i i don't think we are yeah we are still doing anything like that in india what i have seen through but again i am i might not have seen everything as well 
but sure. at the same time what you said i think if we do the basic job right you will create opportunity for this contribution of you know the people who have to study and hey they have a street light to treat under truthfully i tell you i am not a believer of lux levels mm -hmm. you are not required to have 200 lux to read that's not truth and soon we will see that in standards as well so what i'm saying is i sorry i'm god you said that no no i i am i'm i'm abused sometimes to say that but, but that is truth actually i'll i'll give you a very small anecdote i was uh, at uh, light fair usa there is a gentleman called kit carter who is uh, who was i don't know if he's still alive or not I'm, i'll google it today but he was 80 year old and he was practicing lighting design since about 60 years and this is this is the guy who was who was presenting and he flashed the standard which was 50 year old and size standard which said reading 20 lux and mm -hmm. then 2000 i think it was 14 or 15 i i'll have to check 14 and 15 saying 300 lux so he was asking the question <laughs> what went wrong and which is what you know uh, has, our, has our biology uh, deteriorated exactly, so much exactly. over the last 60 so years. our dna will also take a while to change <laughs> or our eyes will deteriorate in a while so the truth is it is also because the ambience has become bright so you need to be brighter to create a context so many other reasons of it and also i would say certain responsibility of the industry because you had more or you mm -hmm. had just like uh, uh, pronet said that you have the technology so you're using it so you have the light in lesser energy you are using it so yeah. that's what happened but anyways digressing from the topic uh, itself by uh, yeah so i think no, no, but it's nice sash to hear about the examples from from other places um thanks for that really any thoughts on this i could could building facade lighting have an agenda that is a little more inclusive yeah i mean uh, it depends yeah it depends on the policies really it's more policy uh, uh, related really uh, i mean there but actually there's no dearth of at least in our cities at least there's no dearth yeah. of uh, uh, lighting right in terms yeah. of resources you know uh, for for lighting it's just the quality of lighting but you know at that level it doesn't matter yeah. because it's not the thing but yeah but uh, of course it really and actually it does because it's it's sad because when you when you see the 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 like at least for bombay that the amount of money that the the municipal yeah. corporation has uh versus other cities and you know what they're doing they they always kind of pushing the buck back onto the private uh uh you know companies sure. and just relying on crm and then it just goes into you know no control right that's the whole idea i mean that's all loss is really no control yeah. i mean when you speak of uh, relying on public companies so it's very interesting but i used to work in the uk for a few years and over there there's something the developer actually actually has to enter into an agreement with the local council it's called a, a section 106 agreement where they are bound to provide either cash uh, or undertake works of public um, infrastructure improvement you know whether that's just repaving the footpath or installing bollards or putting in planters or or doing a street light or a crossing or whatever and these are wired into uh, you know their conditions for the development approval being granted so you know it could be nice to see somebody uh, petitioning for that to happen with the, i mean architecture as a whole but since we're on the subject of lighting you know so 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 the acceptance is that yes the public uh, authority or the local council doesn't have the means or the expertise but you know your client as the private developer is engaging those expertises and and certainly has the means so can the owners be you know put back on them to do something however small yeah you know it all comes back to policy it's not really about yeah. the it's the will yeah so, yeah you know like i'm yeah. part of uh, i'm part of a thing called bandra collective which is yes i'm aware yeah uh, of, uh, uh, local uh, yeah friends who are architects uh, yeah very, Uh, I mean, amazing architects, all based in Bangalore. We do pro bono work for the yes. for the BMC. We did uh, the Carter Road Promenade. So we did lighting there as well, and we we know what we've gone through in terms of you know 
uh, the budget was not a problem, but also convincing, I mean, making it happen, contractors, contracts, all of those things. Yeah. So uh, it's a it's a it's a big uh, struggle really uh, for that. But yeah, yeah, I mean, someone has to kind of uh, take it on and uh, do that. But otherwise, yeah, we don't have a lack so, of resources. So it's a bullet point for the next Vanda Collective agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Puri. And uh, Gaurav, so the industry take on this. What do you think? How do we how do we sow in a social agenda into lighting public spaces, especially? I think there's definitely scope for it. It's something that hasn't been considered or um, focused on now. If you see... Uh, Builders get FSR accessions for certain types of developments, usually for parking structures in Mumbai. I was born, raised in Mumbai, lived there most of my life. And uh, I used to, used to stay at a building called Oberoi Springs. We had this huge parking garage right next door, which was constructed by the builder to get FSR relaxation, which was never used. And then I studied, there were multiple such parking structures across Bombay, which the public doesn't even know that they exist. So it was a tremendous waste of funds and uh, never got any utilization out of it. That versus the kind of rules that you, uh, policies that you mentioned from the UK, where if the same funds were diverted towards something that I, was li public lighting, for example, uh, it yeah. could actually make a difference. It was something that yeah. definitely needs to be given serious thought. And uh, you know, on, on the one side, we have uh, the concept of light pollution, and uh, on the other side, we also have uh, multiple studies. I've read a couple of them which talk about how alleys and streets which have increased lighting because of the residual facade lighting that's done on structures right adjacent to them uh, contribute to reduced crime rates as well as enhanced sense of safety and security. Yep. So again, something that's very debatable and there are multiple, yep. but definitely something to be looked at. Great. Thank you all. I'm being reminded that as ever with interesting discussions, we are pressed for time. So um, let's get on me to wind up. And I'd like to say thanks to everybody. Thanks to Jaffar and Mohiti for making this able to happen. Thank you to Aidak and Karishma. Um, for our panelists, thank you for a lively discussion. I think uh, there's a few things to take away from the early part of the discussion. I got that, you know, the, the prevalence or the, the rushing ahead of, of, of different technology in lighting, particularly when we speak of uh, interactive tech or when we speak of programmable lights, as in, is allowing us to do a lot in not just expressing a mood in a building, but allowing that mood to change or allowing that abstract idea to change from, uh, you know, from, from celebration to mourning to, uh, to, to whatever we need it to be. And that can be done not just through media projection and not just through massive LED walls, but also through subtler techniques of, of, of color or intensity or even the, uh, the, the optics involved. So that was, was nice to hear about. I think everybody had a fair few ideas on how we can raise the awareness of, of lighting design in the country. And I think it was quite interesting to, to, to realize when Gaurav was talking at the end is that, you know, that the, the last and the second last question could sort of tie in together because, um, of course, you, you want to raise the level of awareness and by doing something which forces private development to do something that gives back to the public by policy or by regulatory framework, will contribute towards raising that public's awareness of what would like you can achieve at, at ideally no cost to them. And then maybe the next time they think of a project, they actually stop to think that they might benefit from a lighting designer. But uh, yeah, I think the, the, the road is paved for, for Jaffa to introduce all sorts of exciting new initiatives to, to raise up the bar in terms of what, what good lighting can do um, and, and keep up the good work that they're already doing. So thank you everybody for joining today. I'm going to sign off on that note. And good evening. Enjoy the rest of the day. Great. Thank you. Thanks thank so you. much. Pleasure. Thank you, Pravi. You, you were thank you. And thank you, Pravi. You were a fabulous host. And equally, um, such a pleasure of having uh, Harmeet Singh and Pranit and Tejas. Tejas being a little unwell today. And Gaurav, yes, participating and you know making this uh, entire discussion so fruitful. I hope uh, all the audience enjoyed.
and feel free to write to us and um, happy learning and have a great evening ahead. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you all of you. Thank you all. Thank you.